I'm going to start with a recap of follow through and overlapping action, as well as some of the other principles of animation. I'm minus scaling this hat on the uh, X to flip it. Lastly, the feather with that grid in the image. That's yeah, that's going to be what I run for president as getting rid of all that. Simple scene. It's going to be a head wearing a hat and a feather in the hat. So let me actually scale this feather down a little bit. So let's think it through. The head's going to bob forward. The hat's going to go with it and the feather. But we're doing follow through and overlapping action. So first thing I'm going to do is put my anchor point at the bottom near where the uh, neck would be, right about there. And let me test that with R for rotate. Yep, that's moving right. OK, so I'm happy with that. The hat is going to be on top of the head, and I'm also going to parent it to the head. So I can use my pick whip or my drop down menu. I'm in my switches. If you don't see those, just click toggle switches and modes. There's my modes. Click switches again, and we're back. There's my head. You see the hat is parented to the head. Now for the feather, well actually, before we even get carried away with that, the hat, we got to set the anchor point. I'm going to set the anchor point. Let's see what it looks like at the back of the head. Let's try the middle of the head. OK, perfect. I'm happy with that. Always test out your motion before you keyframe because, you know, you don't want to have to redo your anchor point and all that stuff. All right, let me scale the feather down a little bit just so I can fit it in the shot. All right, and obviously for the feather, I'm going to put the anchor point at the bottom. I don't even need to test that. That one's a given. All right, here we go. So if I want the head to bow forward, you know, that would just be my rotation. Oops, let me feather. I'm going to parent the feather to the hat. So the hat is parented to the head. The feather is parented to the hat. Fantastic. This would just rotate the whole character rig. Fine, but that's boring. So we're going to do a quick recap on the 12 principles of animation. And the first one we're going to do is anticipation. Anticipation is setting up your animation with the opposite motion first. So we know he's going to bow his head forward. So anticipation would be the head moving back before it moves forward. Does that make sense to everybody? We want the head to go forward. So anticipation, we're going to go backwards first. So I'm going to do a couple empty frames, click rotate. We're going to go backwards a little bit to draw the eye to that motion. Then we go forward and bow the head down. And the head will eventually come back up to zero. So let's look at our motion. Anticipation, main action, resting position. The resting position is just the default for the character. Anticipation. The opposite direction. So Superman crouches down before he flies up. Or if a boxer is going to throw a punch, he winds up backwards before throwing the punch forward. There's our anticipation. There's our main motion. And we go back to our resting pose. That's an example of anticipation. I'm going to easy ease these keyframes by right clicking. This is an example of slow in, slow out. Slowing out of here, slowing into there. That's another of the 12 principles of animation. So if the head is going backwards, I'm going to have it slow into that. So going here, I'm going faster out of the first, slower into the second. So it's going to slow down. And then as the head's coming forward, I'm going to have it go faster out of it like that. And then I'll gradually have it slow into the resting position like that. Give it a little bit more life. I click speed graph to get out of it. Any questions on slow in, slow out, also known as easy ease in After Effects and that recap of the speed graph? No? OK. We're cooking with gas tonight. Firing on all cylinders. Follow through an overlapping action. As the head is going back, the hat will have extra life moving after the head, it's following along with it. So I'm going to hit R for rotate on my hat. And just as we're about to reach the back and before it's coming forward, I'm going to tilt the hat back a little bit. 
and it's going to be a little bit behind these keyframes. So right about here, I'll get it back to zero. And then once it gets to the front, the head's tilting back. I'm going to tilt it forward a little bit because it's behind the head's motion. We're right about here. I'll set it to zero. And then I'll have it go back a little bit and then jostle to the front. That's a little bit of overshoot that we just did going past the main motion and then back. So let's take a look at what that looks like. See the extra life we added with the follow through and overlapping action to the hat? I sure do, Professor Robleski. That's cool. Aw, oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? There's our anticipation. The hat is moving behind the head, so it's a little bit behind it doing the opposite motion. That's our follow through and overlapping action. The main thing to remember with follow through and overlapping action, the further you get away from the source of motion, the more behind each object is, which means this feather is going to trail behind the motion of the hat. So I'm going to hit R for rotate. And right about here, I'm going to start with my feather. I could puppet pin it if I wanted, but I'm going to just do this to a. Uh, there we go, a little bit of drag. Set it back to zero here, so it's behind it. Hat's going forward. Now it's going to rotate more so. A little bit of drag, it's behind it. Hat's at the zero. So now I'm going to move it back a little bit. Have it go back even further. And a little bit of overshoot. And I'm going to easy ease those. Oops. It's part of our 12 principles. Slow and slow out. Now let's take a look at our main motion. See how much more life that has? So that is three of the 12 principles of animation tied together in one motion to add that little bit of subtlety and professional polish, anticipation, follow through and overlapping action, easy ease. And we also did overshoot. Actually, that's four of them right there. We could also, if we wanted, throw in some squash and stretch. So if I got the head here, I hit S, non-uniformly scale it. As the head goes up, that's going to be our stretch. So I'm going to do it just after it starts moving. And I'm going to go up. So if it's 156, let's do 186. We went up 30. Oh, that's way too much. Let's do 166. We'll go up 10 in 10, 146. There's a stretch. Go back to 156, 156. Always remember your numbers. And then on the down, I'll do a little bit of squash just for the fun of it. Go forward a little bit. That's a great spot to squash. So I'm going to do 166, 146. Squash is down and out. Back up to 156, 156. Stretch up and in, squash down and out. Let me ease those. See if that pushed our motion any further. See? Adds even more life to it. Has a little bit of weight to it now. It's got that cartoonish liveliness about it. Any questions? For the squash and stretch, if you go up 10, you go in 10 for the stretch. So I'm going in, I'm going up 10, going in 10, keeping my volume consistent. There's my 156, 156 for the normal shape. And then for the squash, I went down 10 and in 10 to keep the volume consistent. Always keep the volume consistent with your squash and stretch. That's five of the 12 principles right there. Uh, 
basic graphic design is one of them, like layout and thinking of where things are going to be. Um, another one is arches, like things move in an arch pattern and the head is rotating back and forth along an arch. So technically, this is seven of the 12 principles of animation right here. A lot different than just moving the head forward. That's why I want to see with your final homeworks, that understanding of the 12 principles of animation, that notice to detail and how things should move when they're parented together. All right. And of course, you could hit U to see all the keyframes. Like such. We've got our overshoot, slow in, slow out, anticipation, and follow through and overlapping recap all handled. OK, because now we're going to go back to our letter morph and we're going to apply all of those to our letter morph. And in addition, this second shape, we're going to strategize when and how it should come in. The first motion, the A is swinging counterclockwise. So we can add some overshoot to that. I'm going to rotate the letter, not the shapes inside it. So if I click here, have it go forward. Oops, a daisy. What I do wrong? I forgot to set the anchor point. I sure did. I'm going to put it right here at the bottom corner. Now I'm going to set that anticipation up. It's going to go forward. And then we could amplify that motion going back a little bit. This extra weight, we could have it tip back a little bit. As it's springing forward, have it start coming down. Now, it's not just going to hit the ground. It's going to overshoot up a little bit. So I'm going to go four, zero. Let's actually go past it a little bit. So we'll go four, four, go four a little bit. Then we'll do three, three. Go four a little bit. Then we'll do two, two. And they're going to get closer and closer. as we get tighter and tighter with our overshoot. All right, now let's take a look at that overshoot. And I'm going to easy ease it. So that's overshoot plus anticipation with that rotate. So we're getting a little bit more weight to it now. OK, happy with that. Now let's start planning the lowercase to the B, and then we can worry about follow through, overlapping action, creating that sense of drag and extra weight inside. So I think right about here, that second B should start coming in. So let's see what's what. Here it is right here. It's this path right here. All right. Let's add an empty keyframe right there. So here's our keyframe. And we've already got a perfect keyframe. This is where it's going to end up and look pretty. That's where it starts and look pretty. So we've got two perfect keyframes. We can start distorting and changing our shapes now as we see fit. All right. So I'm going to, if I right click, go to mask, shape and path. Here's a new thing I haven't shown you yet. Free transform points. I can move them all together. So that's just magically appearing there. And then do the same here. Another transform, make it a little bit bigger. with that motion. So what I'm going to do one frame before that scale up is I'm going to just 
completely move that path off the screen so I don't have to worry about it. So it's off the screen. We go forward one frame. And it's starting to grow in. So that's my strategy. Just keep it out till we need it. And I'm going to get rid of this keyframe here. Because we saw it coming in a little bit again from that perfect keyframe at the beginning. But there we go. Starting to like that. So I'm going to easy ease all these. And let's take a look at our shapes. Now, right here, this one's getting a little goofy, so it's probably right there. OK, good. So I can go through. And start fixing this morph to make it look the way that I want. It's all up to you as the artist, how much attention do you want to put into it? How much time do you have? I'm just showing you some of this stuff like free transforming, changing all the shapes at once. OK. So what I'm going to do here. This is getting thick here, so I'm going to. Start lining this up. With that leg. Change the weight of it. And then start having everything slide to the back. Get a little thinner. Actually, get a little wider, we could do. Have it move a little bit in this direction. Line these up a little bit better. Bear in mind, I'm just going through this quickly to show you a little bit of how just changing that negative shape inside affects the weight. Actually, I think right here, it should probably be thinned out like that. There we go. Let's see that. Adds a little bit of weight to it. That one I will bring forward a little bit. Keep that weight there for a little bit. Now let's take a look at this last shape. We can actually move these forward a little bit. And what I could do here, add another path. Free transform these by right clicking. I could give it a little bit of weight by having it grow down towards the bottom. Like it's getting heavier. And then with these overshoots, I get both shapes. I click and move them back a little bit. Just a little bit for some extra motion. Copy. Let's see, mass path. Have them come forward a little bit. Add a little bit of weight to it. See, now we got some shake on the inside. Once you start playing around with the positive negative space, that's when you start getting that extra weight and the motion from the follow through and overlapping action. Give the whole thing some more life. I'm just doing both of them at the same time to make it uniform and to make this go by quicker. This should be the last one. So I've go for a little bit. A 
then back. All right, now let's take a look at it. See how much different that is? And you can see this shape flying around in the background. It's probably right here. That's it right there. We have these keyframes. Now that shape is gone, and there it is right there. Now I'm happier with that. See how we added a little bit more life to it this way with some anticipation, follow through, overlapping action. Oh, you know what I did? I accidentally deleted the rotations. That's funny. That's what I did. Okay, so let me zoom in. It's this one extra keyframe right here. That's what's doing it. So I'm just going to move it further off because once our uh, rotation kicks in, that's what was making it come back on the screen. Now it's not coming back on the screen anymore. That's just a little bit of quick troubleshooting. And if I wanted to, I could right here start affecting oh, a second. This shape, if I wanted uh, the outside one, I could have it swing forward a little bit. You can do whatever you want with your shapes, see? Just have it swing out a little bit more to tie into that morph a little bit better. Like such. All right. Any questions on that? That will be the end of morphing and tweening. And I just tied it all together with a recap of some of the principles of animation. Okay. Now we can move on to new stuff. Let me just double check my notes. Just remember when you're editing your letters, to have a perfect keyframe at the beginning and the end so you could always go back and rework your shapes if you need to. All right, going to get some water. All right, <clears throat> and just to tie in with squash and stretch, remember to keep your volume consistent. All right, so sequential animation. Here we come. This is going to be fun. It's always fun. All right, so I'm just going to make a shape. I'm going to throw Venetian blinds on it. Venetian blinds is a popular transition. You see it a lot in commercials. Let me make it a little thicker so you can see it. It works like Venetian blinds. Can everybody see that? It worked. Okay, it works on shapes. It works on text. <laughs> Some people use it to bring in type. Put on whatever you want. So you can adjust the thickness of it. You also adjust the angle of it. See, everybody's seen that in commercials. And you could also do this. Uh, so the one on the bottom. I'm going to make a different color. Let's go down my hue wheel. Such. See that? I'm transitioning between the two types using Venetian blinds. All right. Everything moves uniformly. That's Venetian blinds. Everybody understand? Yeah. Okay. 
sequential animation is different. So I'm going to make this the height of the screen. And I'm going to put my anchor point at the bottom middle, pulling down command or control to snap it. So if this is 100 percent. Here's where I went wrong. I got to do my math. In here, not at the scale. OK, I knew I'd figure it out. Like I said, motion design is a lot of. Uh, troubleshooting, so it's really 220 pixels wide. So if I did 1920 slash eight, so 1920 divided by eight, 240 should be eight wide. All right, so let's line that up with our edge. And I'm going to command D. I'll duplicate that seven times. So. I'm going to grab the last one. Move it over to the edge. Select all of them. And I'm going to go to my align and I'm going to distribute. Off the centers, let's try right here. There we go. I'm going to distribute off the horizontal center. Now I am filling up the screen. And I also noticed that this last one was not fully covering up the screen. So I'm going to select all of them again. Redistribute them. There we go. OK. So I've got all of them. I'm going to hit S for scale. And we're going to non-uniformly scale these over a short amount of time. Let's say this fast. Sure, why not? All right. So I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to scale all these down to zero. There's our motion. All right, great. Now we got to make sure all the boxes are in the right order. Or else the sequence won't work. See, this is off. This one should be on the bottom. Like that. Now we'll go through an order and make sure they select an order. OK, perfect. They're in chronological order. Now our sequence, how many frames do we want our sequence to be? So let's do six. We're six frames for the sequence. So I'm going to select all my shapes. And I'm going to hit the alt and the bracket key near the letter P. To snap these. All right, great. So now the first one I click on will be the start of my sequence. So I've got them all selected. I clicked on the bottom one first. Right click. Keyframe assistant. Sequence layers. I do not want overlap for this. Now they're stepped out in the sequence. And I'm going to hit the letter U and you go, wait, those layers, all that keyframing, there's no layer covering it. That's a fast, easy fix. I'm going to hit command A to select all of them. And once again, I'm going to hit alt and the bracket two away from the letter P and I filled out the screen. There's my sequence. And there's my sequential animation. OK. Any questions over that so far? None. OK. Because now we're going to kick it up a notch. Which is what we do in here. And we'll select them all, pre-compose them, and I'll call this sequence one. All right, great. Now let's go back to our effects and I'll throw a fill on it. And I'll make this first one blue. I'm going to duplicate it, command D, and we'll go forward a few frames. Let's say three frames. One, oh. One, two, three. Let's do two frames. I'm going to offset my animation by sliding it in the timeline and hitting the bracket next to the letter P to snap it to the playhead. I'm going to change the color of the fill 
Let's make it a little darker. I'm going to go forward two more frames. You can see my sequence right there. I'm going to hit Command D. Oops. Duplicate the sequence. Hit the bracket by the letter P to snap it into place. Change the color of that. Now I've got a multicolor sequence. OK. That's not all. I'm going to go two more frames, duplicate this one more time, bracket to snap it. And this one, I'm going to color it bright yellow. This one we'll try and use as an alpha mat. OK. So just to make sure there's no gaps, I'm going to select all my layers. Give them a solid stroke. On my original. There we go. Now there won't be any gaps. All right, so here we go. Here's our animation. And we're going to use this yellow one as our pre comp um, alpha mat. So I'll rename this one. I'll just call it Matt. So we're not confused. All right. And these I'll pre-compose and I'll just call it animation. Now, I'm going to create a scene from scratch. I give it a solid. And the solid will be colors we didn't use. We didn't use pink. And I'll put some type in it. There we go. There's scene one. I'm going to duplicate scene one in my project panel. So that I can edit it without affecting the original. You'll see in a second. So if I change the solid settings. And I make this blood red. If I go back to scene one, it's still pink. Because we duplicated it in the project panel. And I'm going to change the font too, just so that there's even more visual difference between the two. OK, perfect. Scene one, scene two. Excellent. Here we are, here's our mats. So I'm gonna put scene one and scene two in here. And if I use this mat as an alpha mat, it should work. So let's test it out. So if I wanna go through them in the proper order, I put scene two above. Apply my alpha mat to that. I still get the color bars up. Oh, you know what? Wait a second. Put this above here. All right, so to keep the color bars, here's where it's going to get tricky. See, now I'm seeing them. OK. I'll take that as a win. It's just my layer stack order. And everybody's seen this in commercials, credit sequences, whatnot. That's why I'm showing you it. It's just sequential animation, timing things out. You get creative, you know, use it as an alpha mat from a transition from one scene to another. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> Let's press forward then.
All right, got my notes all set up. And we're gonna mess around a little bit with repeaters because repeaters are used in credit sequences a lot as well. So I can close this, that, that. All right, so I'm going to draw a star. Make it red with a white stroke. Why not? Make that stroke smaller. OK, and I'll put the anchor point in the middle for it. I'm just going to hold down command and double click on the pan behind tool. It's the fastest way to center your anchor point. Let's move this right about here. OK. So I've got my arrow tool selected and I've got my shape layer selected. I'm going to go to add and add a repeater. Let's try eight copies. Now I'm going to twirl down the transform repeater. The position right here is what's got them stepped out. So if I change that to zero, they're all going to be right on top of this original one. If I change my rotation, I'm going to rotate them out. So if there's eight, if I do 360 slash eight, 360 divided by eight is 45 degrees. OK, now let's take a look at our anchor point. If I spread out the anchor point, I now have these in a radial design. Don't forget anything with a stopwatch can be animated. So I can go from like such. You've seen this in commercials and credit sequences. It's just a fast, easy way of getting some motion. We can get even more complex with it. Let's look at the offset. Okay, let's try. See the position, we can then have them start to fall after they make a circle. Drop down off the screen. Bring them back up. Try something different. We can do the start and end opacity as well if we wanted. That's just showing you some of the things you can do with. Well, there's someone loud in the hallway. That's just a quick example of some of the things you can do with the repeater and the transform repeater down here. Remember, zeroing it out on both, they'll stack on top of the original. And you could use your math to get the right uh, rotation and spread out that you want. So I'm going to call this one repeater. Hide it. And I'm going to make another star. Same star we had before. Got my arrow tool selected, my shape layer. I'm going to call this one offset. And I'm going to add offset paths. I'm going to click the stopwatch for amount. See the number of copies. Let's turn our stroke off. There's the copy offset. Go a little lower with the copy number. Let's change this to a stroke with no fill. So we'll up the number of copies. There's our offset. 
Not going to change the miter on it. But that's pretty interesting what we did there. There we go. Now we've got it working. Everybody's seen this a million times over. So we've got that happening. And then we can. You could also animate the offset that way. So I'm going to animate it backwards into the negative space. Let's go negative. Like that, remember, watch out for too much flashing strobes. Some people are very susceptible to that. And I'm going to have this rotate one full circle. And the offset should rotate with it. Like such. Complex, quick, easy motion. Can everyone see the difference between the repeater and the offset? All right, and you've all seen both of them used in credit sequences and commercials. So you see, I can get complex motion very quickly with barely any keyframing. All right. That was, let me double check. I think that was everything I wanted to cover tonight was the difference between the repeater and the offset. Yeah. All right. Hooray. Next week, we'll start tackling puppet pinning and character rigging. All right. Does anybody have anything for me to look at for lab time tonight? If you do, just let me know. I could stick around till like 730 if nobody's got any stuff for lab. OK, I don't want this shadow that they made below it. So I'm going to mask that out and then I'm going to pre-compose this. I've got my shape layer selected so I can use my pen tool as a mask. And for my mask, I hit M to open up the mask options and I'm going to choose subtract. Subtract it from there. Great. Now I can pre-compose this. Put PC pre-comp. Move all attributes. There we go. Yeah, watch out for where things are touching. That's going to mess up the puppet pinning. And remember, with puppet pins, you always pin down what you want to move as well as what you do not want to move. I will go forward a little bit and then I just move the pins I want to move. And I can also click and drag from outside the bounding box to move multiple ones at a time. Let's check our mesh. The mesh is a bit too big. That's why some stuff was getting a little too uh, strung together. Turn that down a bit. There we go. That's going to work a lot better. We hit you. All 
And I can select this entire first row of keyframes. Copy. Paste them. The playhead will they'll get paste wherever the playhead is. Select all of them. Easy ease them by right clicking. Oh, Dino, this one's for you. I came up with another thought on that text you showed me. So Dino showed some text that scaled upwards. Um, I'm going to try scale wipe. I think that's what it is. That's starting to work. So let's take that off. And I think it's hitting the bounding box. So I'm going to pre-compose it. Remember, this red around it is our bounding box. And if I pre-compose it, that blasts the bounding box to the edge of the screen. Now let's try and place the effect on our bounding box. And look what we've got happening. Already fancy. So you can mess around and get whatever type of motion you want and then change the angle. There it goes. Okay, so that's our solution. I pre-composed the type to get rid of the bounding box. Then I threw CC scale wipe onto the bounding box, onto the pre-compose. I'm going to stretch it like 26. Animating the center up and down is what's going to make the text go to the top of the screen and then fly off it. I changed my direction to zero, so it's pointing straight up. And we'll have this happen pretty quickly. Because you don't want to, like, delay on it. So we can say, there's the stretch. Let me hit U for my keyframes. Okay. And then shortly after it, I'm going to let it hang there for a little bit just to create some drag. And then drag it down more until it's off the screen. And I'm going to easy ease those. Let's see our final result. Like that. Let's pretend you love that. Let's get templatable here. Text test PC. If I duplicate it, I can bring it in here. Hide the original. Change what this says. Use my name. Go back. Copy my effect. Put it on the duplicate that I made in the project panel. Now I've got the same effect with different type. If you got more than one word, you could have this effect. Just put each word on a pre-comp to get the look you want. And since I spread those out, I can select both of them and line them back up so that they're in the center a little bit more. And there we go. CC scale wipe. That's the effect that Dino was looking for.
So let's kick it up a notch because that's what we do in lab time. I'm going to throw an adjustment layer in here. Because why wouldn't I? I'm just messing around with some color settings to animate that over time. And I'm going to use a time expression, time asterisk. Let's try 120 on the evolution, just that there's some constant motion on this fractal map. Let's up the complexity to 12. Scale it up even more. Okay, so there's a fractal map. I'll hide that background. For my displacement, I'll choose that map. Now we got a little bit of that randomness to it. To add a little bit more of a hand-drawn look. That's another thing they did. Get that less computerized, sterile look to it. A minor displacement map. So let's push this and let's see what radial scale wipe does. Probably does something similar. Oh, cool. I said it's the same thing, but with an arc to it. That's pretty cool. And the reverse looks like it makes it come inward instead of outward. That's pretty wild. So that's radial scale wipe. And you'd animate the center and how much distortion you want. Cool. Part of the fun of just experimenting and getting creative and seeing what does what. And that's just animating the center of CC radial scale wipe. And also pre-composing and throwing those pre-comps in a new sequence is a good way to experiment with things without damaging your original as well. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to put a time expression on here, just so it's always moving. Like that. Now we've got some life.
Interesting. That's CC light burst. You can see how moving the center around affects whatever image you're using it on. That's pretty neat. Oh, so every time I move this with center on, it stays in the center. That's odd. Whenever you're using effects, make sure you explore all the presets and drop downs and buttons to see what each setting does to get your own look but when you use them right you get a lot of pop all right so five more minutes if anyone has anything they want me to look at please let me know i just did gather any like photos and stuff if i don't know anything yet but i'm okay. working on it okay did my did my brainstorming a few weeks ago help showing how to split out layers and add life to them and stuff like that yeah you definitely have to get those elements to put in those layers first. cool i'm working on it. now Hopefully, when you're working in Photoshop to like separate out layers, you're working with the HD template, like the HD TV template, so that everything's going to be one to one in your layout. Yeah, yeah. Familiar. Okay, perfect. Yeah, once you got that 1920 by 1080 layout in, in Photoshop, everything's so much smoother sailing. As I mentioned earlier, light effects take a long time to render, so use them sparingly. Not bad. All right, so. Reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns, and Thursday we'll pick up and uh, do more work. Uh, hopefully I can see some stuff from people so we can maximize our lab time, and uh, have a great evening.